Do you have a favorite kind of fallen pine cone? <laughs> oh. So that film Last Orders that I did with David Heyman and Adrian Dunbar, which I produced, um, we asked the two actors to improvise um, because they felt that the script was a bit tight and they, do you know David Heyman, Scottish actor, and do you know Adrian yeah. Dunbar from Northern Ireland? Yes. So they said, can we just improvise? And there's this moment in the in the film where David says to Adrian, because he's an angel, David plays his angel, who's coming to see this guy, and he says, you talk about love, life, beauty, the falling pine cone. <laughs> <laughs> and he improvised that. And it's stuck with me ever since. Yeah. I just thought it's like a it's it's a euphemism for just life and everything in it. Life and everything in it. The falling pine cone. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Pop. I'm Cricket. I'm Wombat. And if you haven't figured it out, we have a guest. I'm not even going to bother explaining who this man is because you will probably know his voice in some way, shape or form. Ladies and gentlemen, the incredible Rupert Degas. Hello, so great to be here. It's fantastic. I love you guys. You're so great. Oh, one of the notes I've got, I wanted to <laughs> ask you about... Oh. It's called the, the, you you played essentially Trump. Oh yeah, La Madre Bunana. La not Madre that, Buena. Right? How did yes. that come about, and what was that like? My friend Sarah uh, Clift, who wrote the uh, who wrote and directed it, the short film. She used to work for an advertising agency in London, and um, she called me and said, "Do you want to do this short?" I said, "Yes, of course." <laughs> uh, you know, so I just got to play Donald for you know like a few hours. It was fantastic. It was great, but. <sighs> It was the it was the best ever, the best film. It's a great film, and basically they make a pinata out of Donald Trump, and all the little Mexican kids bash it, <laughs> and they all cheer because this huge pinata looks like Trump, and it's basically and all the Mexican kids hitting Trump. It's it's. A, have you seen it? It's a cute little film. We'll, we'll have to go down yeah, and yeah. find it. If it's, it's great. Um, were you like worried about the reception to playing Trump at all? Was that a thing? Oh God, no, 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 no. This is this is the shame since he. Uh, since he hasn't been president, um, there's, a, there's been. He's no longer in the cultural zeitgeist. No, I mean, there's like, you know, it's apart from recently when. My NFTs, they're the best NFTs. Oh, win my dinner God, that with was me. It's going to be a great dinner. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, no, when, when you can have someone who's that impersonatable, I think, is that a word? It is now. Um, it is now. Um, there are many words that aren't words in this it's podcast. You know, like Tony Blair, it was, yeah, well, you know, somebody who talks, you know, like that. it's just the gift, you know, King Charles. <laughs> um, but when you got Biden, he's pretty hard to do. Albanese's really hard to do. You know, he's got that sort of thing, that, that, that sibilant S going on. But, you know, ScoMo was kind of like that vocal fry thing, you know, and you, you get a voice and you go, they're, they're satirizable. Yeah. Satir oh, I'm, my English is terrible. Um, <laughs> Mine too. There's an irony in this. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, it's, I, so I love it. So, no, I have no problems with impersonating people because I think if you're in the public eye, um, oh, absolutely. and especially if you're a, a politician who are just, you know, the scum of the earth, um, yeah, take Was that piss. Churchill? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just scummy. Just scummy, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I just think, you know, absolutely, they're fair game. Your vocal impressions got... When did that begin? Because we all have this creative spark that leads us down the road of either yeah. being a voice actor or anything. And you've been described to have, like, your vocal elasticity is the same way that Jim Carrey is able to just mold his face. Uh, yes, I've someone, seen that quote on yes. your website and it's perfect. Yes, I love but that where quote. Where did it all start? It started, um, I guess, with a show called Three of a Kind uh, in on the BBC with Lenny Henry, Tracy oh. Ullman and David Copperfield. It was a, a sketch show. And the sketches were relatively clean, so it was good for children. And I, I was sort of 11 or 12 when I was watching that. And I used to put the cassette recorder in front of the television <laughs> and I'd press play and record on, on, on the little cassette player and I'd learn the sketches. And Tracy Ullman, I think, was the first voice the first sort of character actor that I became aware of as yeah. as a child that I went, that's what I want to do. Because her ability with playing characters was phenomenal. Yes, in the 70s, I used to watch Mike Yarwood, who was an impressionist, and then later on, you know, the Rory Bremners and, and the Alistair McGowans, et cetera. But for me, I think it was three of a kind. And then that roundabout was the same time as The Young Ones and um, Blackadder. Yes, so two I, incredible shows. Yeah. I just was, I knew all the scripts of Blackadder and the young ones. And 
it was all the voices. So, of course, I was impersonating all of those voices. But then, of course, I was a huge Star Wars nut. So I would learn, I knew the entire, I probably still know the entire script <laughs> of, of Star Wars, A New Hope. Um, yep. And one of my first impressions was, was um, Obi-Wan. Alec Guinness. Kenobi, of course, in those days when it was these, you know, these aren't like the droids here. you're looking for. <laughs> right? You don't need to see his identification, you know, sort of. Moss Isley Spaceport. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. And it was that kind of... So I was doing that, and then with Empire Strikes Back, it was then Yoda, and you'd be a, you know, 11-year-old kid going... Bleh, bleh, bleh. And it was fun getting a glass and start doing Darth Vader, and I just thought, hmm, I'm good at this. Uh, I quite like this. This is fun. I'm amusing myself. Um, yeah. So that's was it, it like at school was, as a kid? And in the playground, you'd just be like the one everyone would flock to to just get amusement. So would they like be jabbing characters at you? Um, close. I was actually, I, I was kind of like a little overweight kid. I was kind of like the short, fat kid at school. So I was picked on. No, oh, I was bullied. So you needed to be funny. I, like a lot of comics and a lot of impressionists, cover your pain with you, humor. You, you cover your pain with humor and you stop. I stopped the bullying by making the bullies laugh because if you could make them laugh, you suddenly um, distract them. Distract, yeah. Stephen Fry um, said something amazing in his book, Moab is My Washpot, because he was bullied at school as well. And his way to stop being bullied was to say, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm getting an erection. And that would stop the bullies. <laughs> But it disarmed It them. did, clearly. It disarmed them. <laughs> you know, it's disgusting. And the thing is, with bullies, you've got to disarm, disarm them with whatever weapons you have, whatever armory you have. And for me, it was doing voices. And normally, it was the teachers. If, if I impersonated the teachers, and I impersonated all the teachers at school, suddenly it was like, oh, now I'm cool. You're attacking authority. I'm attacking authority. So, ah, so yeah, they're not going to yeah. pick on me because You're not I'm be a snitch or anything shorter like than them. Yeah, because yeah, I'm not a jock or whatever. And so... I just carried on like that, and I've been doing it ever since. But what happens is now, and later now, now as a sort of professional uh, actor, voice actor, audiobook narrator, what what have you, all those voices are in this kind of vault. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then there is sort of in a bag, and I think as an actor, what you do is is you you have to observe and you just soak up without even realizing it's not like you do it on purpose but you've got to be aware that everybody you meet you are kind of getting a bit of their essence and you're storing it somewhere for later use for when you need it yeah. for when you need it because you never know i've just narrated a book that that it is there is it is set in in a school and there are teachers so i pulled ah, out so some of your old teachers made an appearance they did yeah. absolutely uh, you know mixed up with a bit of few teachers from harry potter and a few you know they always throw in alan rickman cuz snape's always a good one and um it's just, yeah so it's from being a child and hearing those voices and copying those sketches and just learning them over and over again was kind of what got me into it. Yeah. And, and now I still use those voices. I try and bring Obi-Wan Kenobi into most audiobooks as well. Um, You're not a, um, you don't actually read much fiction on account of the amount of audiobooks you I do, don't is that read right? Any fiction. Ever? Like, ever. Did, now, was that something that happened before you started doing audiobooks or has it always just been. I've. I've liked my stories to come from from film. I'm I'm a very film film and TV is my visual yeah. medium. I like my stories to be told to me uh, in that medium. And and I think with with long form TV shows starting back in back with sort of I guess Lost was I think the first one that was just like yeah. it just it carried. wasn't episodic and everyone went oh and, and now of course that's now TV. Um, I've always liked nonfiction. But the audiobooks thing, because I narrate about 15 or 20 audiobooks a year and 99% of them are fiction, uh, I, I feel like I'm getting my fill. Yeah, that, yeah that's, of course. that's enough for the year. Yeah. Because it's, it's almost like it's just considered work. It's work. But also I'm like, I've realized now that I really like crime. I really like crime thrillers. Because yeah. I, I just really get into stories about, I want to know who the murderer was. And, yeah. I, and, and, you know, I like the twists and everything. Uh, so I really like that genre of audiobook because I just it's a page turner for you quite literally for me you just, yeah. do, you, do you like find you're going through it and you're speeding up the recording trying to find out who it is sometimes <laughs> sometimes I find myself you know because I don't read the books first I, okay. I, yeah. I don't prep them uh, I, I know you know very bad because uh, you know Perry you're not you've got to prep them but I feel like I I don't have to. Um, 
because I speak to the authors normally and I say, look, could you give me a rundown? A rundown. Like I did, I was doing one last week and uh, like I got th three pages into a chapter and I, I gave this character a, a, a voice. I just gave this character a Scottish accent because I went, ah, fucking, I don't know what accent this character should have. So I just Perfect. Scottish. And then four pages in, it turned out that the character was Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said, do you know, do you know where I'm from? She says, and I'm going, do you know what I'm from? No, I'm from Wales. <laughs> Shit. So, <laughs> so I stop recording, go back three pages, start again. And that's fine. But that's quicker than reading the whole bloody book to find yeah. out. You know what I mean? Because I like to know what happens. I feel that if I kind of know what's coming, I might inform that. Yeah. I know it's a bit of a lame excuse, but I think I might inform it. And I do want to speed You want up. it fresh. I want it, yeah, I want it fresh. It's like this old saying, paralysis through analysis, yeah. and you can overthink something. And I'm I'm kind of, I think I'm always best on the first take, and then yeah. it's downhill after that. <laughs> but as well as that, there's this kind of certain joy that comes to discovering parts of the story. Because if you've been someone that has just decided to prep, you've gone through and you're like, oh, this story is absolute shit. Yeah. And then you have to go back <laughs> and, and, and sit again. in front of a mic. You're just like, yes. fuck! Yeah, yeah. And most of the things, not most, but a lot of books I narrate, I, I'm just like, oh God, they're not paying me enough because it was awful. And I go, I can't get, I can't do this, but I'm going to get through it. I'm going to get through to the end. It's not, not, you've only got to do many, it once, right? But I've only Hopefully. got to do it once, yeah. There's um, two that I want to touch on. Yes. Now, I first um, mm. actually stumbled across you through The Name of the Wind. Oh, yes. Which, you know, fair choice. Like, <laughs> and you obviously sat down with Patrick Rothfuss to. No. Okay, and this explains no. a lot because you go and listen to the American take where Patrick is actually narrating it himself and Ali and I were listening to it in the first time and then we go and listen to Patrick and we're like, Patrick's no. pronouncing them wrong. No, he didn't narrate He didn't narrate the American no, versions. No, so sorry, he, not the American versions. Um, he narrated Silent Regard yes, of Things, right? Silent Regard. Yeah, yeah. And you're just like, he's pronouncing everything wrong. Yeah. So I, I've struggled. So the, 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 the In America... Only in America, it's geo-locked on Audible. If you want to listen to Name of the Wind and Wise Man's Fear, there's another narrator doing them, a brilliant guy called Nick Podell, who's, who's American and he's lovely and he does a lot of fantasy book and he's great. Rest of world is is me. Yeah. So, you know, I'm Canada, South Africa, Australia, UK, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and because they're geo-locked, there's a lot of real diehard King Killer Chronicle fans that want to listen to both versions. But they can't, in America, they can't get my versions and you can't get Nick's versions outside. There's an um, excellent time for us to bring up a VPN if anyone would like to sponsor us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this podcast is not sponsored by NordVPN. No. <laughs> yes. Not yet. Masterworks, no. <laughs> um, so what happened was, is that I, I auditioned. I had to send Pat a, a, a test and he was very happy and confirmed me with the publishers and then I, I narrated the books. Um, with wonderful producer in London, in uh, in England called Peter Ridney, lives in Cheltenham, um, and it was all and it was fantastic. And then when I, I didn't know at the time that they had it had already been recorded by Nick in and it was out in America. I thought, oh, this is I'm going to worldwide, my, worldwide. And then people started. I then looked it up. And that's how I looked it up on the American Audible, and it wasn't there. And I'm like, what, what the hell's going on? So I called up the publishers, Orion, and they said, yeah, we're, we're, we're the UK publishers and rest of world publishers. In America, it's published by a different publishing, publishing company. I said, okay. So then started to get emails from people, from fans, saying, why did you pronounce this wrong? I'm like, what? <laughs> what do you mean, why did I pronounce it wrong? No one, I just pronounced it in a way that- It so was written. It was written. It was written. And so- Going on to some, some Reddits and subreddits, you find a lot of fans go, Nick Bodell worked with Pat Rothfuss to get all the character names right, right? Rupert's getting them all wrong. And I'm going, yeah, but he's an American and Americans say things differently exactly. <laughs> from British accent. So did you actually get on to respond to anyone on Reddit? No, no, I'm not. No, no, I don't know. No, no. <laughs> No, I don't that, want to respond to it. You don't no, want no. the whole fandom to know your username? Yeah, I was, I don't, I'm not even on Reddit. I don't even have a username. Literally, I'm there as a sort of a, a, an, anonymous a, an anonymous observer going, hmm, what are they saying about me? Um, because I, I care what the fans think, you know, and, and there's, there's a real kind of 
split out there. Of, I like Nick's version. I like Rupert's version. I like Nick's version. And it's really weird because you've got two versions to choose from, but they're geolocked. So nobody can actually listen to both. I get emails every week saying, how can I get hold of your version of Name of the Wind? I'm like, I don't know. Get, get a VPN. Not a VPN. Um, <laughs> You know, get a VPN or, or open some audible.co.uk or .com.au account or buy the CDs on mm. eBay, which you can. But And then I get people going, oh, yeah, somebody said I'm, I've been trying to find this for three years. I found it for $25. And I'm like, great. Great. That's a good deal. They want it for, I want it for free. I'm like, why does everybody want everything for free? Why do they How think you're going to have it? Earn a bloody living. I'm not, I'm not going to get paid if you, if you don't fucking pay for the audiobook. So I could be, where can I get your book for nothing? So I feel the way I pronounced things was the way that Peter Rinney and I felt yeah. it was correct to pronounce. I mean, the classic one is you get people going, he used totally the wrong voice from the one that was in my head when I read it. Like, <laughs> oh. oh, my God. God, wow, sorry, I, sh- I should consult everybody because the voice that I read it with my head was, <laughs> and I just think it's the funniest, you know, thing, you know, ruined it for me, didn't, s- you know, I didn't hear it like that. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I had one review for Go back and try it again. I did, um, uh, Gorman Gas did the Mervyn Peake trilogy, you know, do you remember, did you ever listen to the, I actually have, have Have you heard of uh, Mervyn Peake, a British author, yeah, did Mervyn the Peake. Gorman Gas? it was very sort of fantasy stuff and I had this one guy, the review was, this is on Audible, he said, welcome to the Ministry of Silly Voices. He said, <laughs> <laughs> well, fun, okay, like, and he said, it really is American, he goes, it really annoys me when voice actors act. First sentence. Then it was like, yeah, why does he whisper when the character whispers or shouts when the character shouts? Just read the story. I'm like, oh my God. Well, if that's, if you want a GPS, if you want sat nav reading your book, there's plenty that do, but if you Google get to voice, me, yeah, copy you get paste me, the book. I, I perform it. I, I perform it like a radio play. And if that's not what you want, don't listen to my audiobooks because I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a full cast. And if that's not what you want, don't criticize it because that's what I do. Because you did a full <laughs> cast. You did basically. <laughs> a full cast for the Golden Compass as well. Um, uh, yeah, the Golden Compass was actually f- a full that's cast. That's right, it was, yes. it was you. And I played Pan- Panther Lion. Um, and that was great. That, uh, that would have been a very different experience. Were you all just kind of doing your parts or were you all in together? All in together. Oh my God. With Philip, Philip Pullman was sitting at a desk on a U87 with the headphones on and he'd never narrated anything before. And he's a lovely man, gorgeous man. And he's got this lovely voice and he'd sort of read, Lyra, came into Oxford and he'd read the narration in this beautiful voice, which had this softness to it. And then we'd be there, the cast, sort of on three or four mics with scripts like we were doing BBC radio drama. And then, you know, I'd be next to Lyra and, you know, hey, Pan, I'd go, what's happening, Lyra? And we'd do it, you know, as Lyra said, and we'd do it with all the, <laughs> and we'd do it all together. <laughs> And it won tons of, that might it be did. one of the ones we won awards. We won loads of awards. I think we won an Audi or three Audis or something. And it was, it was great. It was really, really, really good fun. Um, and then we did um, Amber Spyglass and Subtle Knife. And uh, yeah, that, that was, you can't, no one does it like that anymore. That had, that had a budget. Warner Brothers put the money into that. Uh, not Warner Brothers, Warner, Time Warner. Time Warner. Yeah. yeah. They put the I think it was Time Warner. Want a music or whatever? Might be right. Yeah, I can't remember. I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> As we've been, had this discussion it's before, you're like, my is, epitaph. it's coming it's like, like it's just being pulled out yes. of your mind palace. You're like, oh, yes, yeah. it's kind of... Yeah, like, he me. couldn't remember that he died. He can't remember. <laughs> uh, yeah, God, no, what a memory. It's terrible. Um, some, but some big thing, big <laughs> corporate paid for it, so it had a good budget. Um, and... It, it, you can tell because it's got music stings and it's got effects on it. And then when the film came out, we all went to see the movie and a few of us went to see it. We were just sitting there going, this is shit. <laughs> Ours is much better. Because <laughs> you, we go back to those impressions. Um, but I recently finished uh, Metro 2033. Oh, that yes. how? Oh, my God. Have you ever... Like, listening to it or reading listening it? to it right, like right. I, I was so enthralled by it like um yeah. just the fact that you had to keep russian accents all the way through <laughs> how in the ever-loving shit i don't know <laughs> but what i was really surprised was when they said there was 2034 and 2035 as well <laughs> there were three books and they got longer and longer and you know i mean i'm worried about doors of stone because i think Pat right that's your like, like a, 15 years down yes, the line am i gonna remember that hour book here's a two two and a half thousand page book <laughs> Jesus. If I think, yeah, it was a big book, um, yeah. and it was all for anybody who doesn't know. It's all set on the the Moscow 
underground. And again, Peter Rinney produced that first one okay. for me, the same guy, the name of the wind, and who is whose father was is Russian, was Russian. So he helped me with all the Russian pronunciations of all the the, the tube stations, the metro stations. Because they were flawless. Oh. It was great. Vyrdvika, <laughs> Sverskaya. And I've just narrated Russian roulette by Anthony Horowitz. So the sort of Oh um, wow, okay. You know, the um Um oh, what was it? It was the, the ah, kid, yeah, Alex Ryder. Alex Ryder. And it's about Yasin, who's the 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 Scorpio assassin, this kind of like, you know, specter. And it's all his life story. And oh man, all Russian, everybody's Russian. That was the book with the Welsh thing, actually. That was, oh, that okay. was the book. Yeah, she's she he he goes to Venice and meets a woman called something. And um the and I can't remember uh, with a German sounding landmark Bauman, and she's in Venice. And I'm, I'm going, oh, I don't know what accent I can give this woman. So that's why I didn't give her a Scottish accent. I gave her kind of a German, Italian, sort of European accent, because I thought Italian would cover it. So it's a sort of, you know, accent a bit German with a little bit of Italian mixed. So you don't quite know it's what, what part of Europe are you from, you know, kind of generic. And then it was like, I am from Wales. And that's what I went. <laughs> <sighs> couldn't be farther from the truth. Yeah, couldn't be further <laughs> but Met- Metro was 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 crazy because once you've got once you have to do an accent like a Russian accent, you go, oh, now I've got to do thirty characters, all with different Russian accents, and I've only got one Russian voice. So you go, so you have the deep one, then you have the light one, then you have the one with the hairs and more like this, then one. More. But eventually, they're all just going to sound the same. Whereas if in the UK, if they're all English, you can oh, at least get away you with. You go it. Liverpool, Manchester, Newcastle, London, yeah. Bristol, you know, whatever. But in Russia, you go, oh, shit. <laughs> so I remember there's just one tough. that's like, Alton, would you like some too? <laughs> well, you <laughs> just sounded like, like, <laughs> like, like a Russian golem. Russian golem. Like Russian golem. <laughs> well, yeah, because you got, I don't know. Um, but again, because I don't read them first, I'm yeah. literally, I don't know who's a main role or who's a, a walk on. So I go, oh, here's a character. And I, and they got one here's line and never voice. appear again. And then I go, oh, this is just a walk on. And he's the lead. I'm like, ah, shit. <laughs> but you, you kind of, you find it and you develop it. And hopefully the listener kind of goes with me on the, on the journey of discovery as opposed to, I've decided on this character voice from, from the first page. It's, it, 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 character voices can change throughout a book. They can, Alter it a little bit, you know. You That's can't. a relief. As someone who's doing his first one, I'm like, oh god. Are you doing your first one? I, I say first long oh, one before, fabulous. and you're just like, oh god, because Australian accents, like, it's very hard to distinguish. It's, yeah. I, I've always thought, like, how am I going to do this? And I've done that whole process of the raspy one, and I've gone. Now I'm going to have to go make it in an international lot. Yeah. Or what you can do with Australia, um, you you can make sort of some of the characters a bit more ochre. A bit more mm-hmm. country. You can make some a bit more sort of, you know, Melbourne private school. You can make some, um, you know, a bit nasal. You can make some a bit kind of, you know, and just kind of. Subtle differences. Subtle differences so that, you know, like if I have sort of a, a an older Australian in a book, I'll often, it'll sort of end up sounding a little bit like Rupert Murdoch or something. You know, one goes sort of so much in that direction, whereas, you know, sort of about Jerry Hall and everything. But but they'll be sort of there. I'll go, okay, that, you know, that would be a sort of a, a an aspirational sort of, you know, older gentleman. Um, but then, you know, but then you go, get your guy, you know, you're sort of like, mate, yeah, mate, you know, and you just kind of. Probably run into a few of those in Bondi, haven't you? Yeah, Bondi, mate, yeah. Nah, I don't know. I don't think I've been to Bondi. No, I have. I, <laughs> I try and avoid it. Um, but yeah, so well, good luck with that. It's fantastic. Oh, it's man. it's hard it's hard work narrating a book. It's it's the concentrating on concentrating, concentrating. I mean, that's always been cricket's downfall, extended concentration. Extended concentration. Well, yes, yes. Why did you not call yourself rugby? Is that because, you know, cricket's long and hang on. <laughs> I need a quick swing. <laughs> or is it cricket as in the 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 Are you doing that live for real? Get the yeah. fuck. <laughs> That's, That's my really highlight good. of my year, folks. Mate, that is so good. <laughs> so the way you have to do it is kind of whistle through your teeth. I can't whistle, so that's fucked. <laughs> oh, you serious? <laughs> You're out. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And then basically you just kind of roll your eyes. Like, and then. That's really good. Have you seen Rob Brydon's Man in a Small Box? Oh, that that is a skill. I don't know how he does that. I come to It's amazing. But the mouth barely moves. Then all of a sudden you're just like hearing this voice from under your yeah. ass. And you're like. One of the reasons I've, I have a beard is because oh, it's a bit, bit short today, but you know, if you bring it down here, you can make a sort of sound like Droopy, Droopy the dog, dog and you sort of get your jowls kind of open, like, just, like that. But the other thing you can do is, is you, 
if you bring it out here, and then you sort of sound a bit like Stephen Hawking. Because there, and then if you put a little thing with your finger in your thing, it can sound like a computer, because you're sounding like you are not really a guy. And uh, yeah, so you just kind of you, yeah. It's <laughs> that is insane. The thing, the shit we we work out that we do with our voices, right? Are you were you musically inclined as a kid? Yes, I I play piano. You and, still play? Uh, yeah, yeah, and I I sing songs from the from the musicals. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like okay. love, love you know me Rocky Horror Show and me Les Misérables. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard of the group Dusty Esky? Dusty Esky. Dusty Esky. It is an Australian no. group up in like the northern. Like, no. no, it's in Melbourne. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And basically, they're just like an Australian men's choir who do like Russian folk songs. And they became so popular that eventually wow. they were in like 20, early 2020, they were actually going to go over to Moscow and sing for the government. But wow. then COVID hit. Well, then they got banned and- <laughs> for being Western propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so it's just like that's that. That's DF's to look them up. Yeah, so. My friend, Lewis McLeod, who you might, have you heard of Lewis McLeod? He played Sebulba in The Phantom Menace. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, great friend of mine is, uh, he, oh my God, the things he can do with his voice. Not only is his Trump amazing, but uh, he he does all the effects from Star Wars. He does TIE Fighters. Really? Um, you know. <laughs> I mean, he, he you know, the, Oh man, you should get Lewis on. I mean, he lives in London, but my God, he's he, open invitation he, for a Zoom. You do a Zoom with him. He, he's he's phenomenal. The, the stuff he can do with his voice. He's like, so he is a kid. Because I asked him what happened, what what was the thing with you, and he said Michael Winslow Police Academy. So he oh, was shit. just like, he was. Oh, I'm gonna do that. He's a sky skies from Glasgow. He's like, right, I'm gonna be like Michael Winslow. That's how he talks. Don't you, Lewis? You do. I know you do. And he's like, <laughs> he'd be like, you know. And what he can do with his mouth, it's it has us in stitches. And we we all entertain each other, our, our group of little VO coterie in London. Our, you know, there's a, three or four of us. We just go out and have a few drinks and we just make each other oh. laugh doing voices. And, and then Lewis does the sound effects and it's just stonking. <laughs> is there a thing where like you will do that while recording? Because I know... On stage productions, there there is very much between some actors a thing of I'm going to make you laugh live on stage. Do you get that with recording? Um, yeah, oh yeah. Uh, but I think it's it's not in, not re- it's not the, the intention is to make the other person laugh. The intention yeah. is just it's love, and you just want to yeah, you just want to uh, enjoy the the moment. So Lewis and I did a show called Scatuni, which we did for for years, where I it was a it started out as a little interstitial on Cartoon Network, which was literally to just go, and coming up next, you know, it was, a, yeah. it was a little chipmunk kind of voice. And I gave it this voice, you know, hey, how you doing? And um, and Lewis was the, the Earl, like, yeah, all he said was, yeah. And, um, <laughs> and then it went into a 15-minute show. And then it became a Saturday morning, four hours live on Cartoon Network. Oh, four hours four hour live. live? With live animation, with this... Uh, a piece of kit called Kedara. So you had, I was in the booth and I um, would be voicing and the this piece of computer equipment would sync the lips to my voice live and someone would control the hands, the legs. Of Holy this, shit. Yeah, like wow. I had, had like 10 or 11 or 12 things to do and then the lips would know how to open and close and that went out. So I'd be interviewing giving prizes to kids and I'd call them at seven in the morning, you know, at home and, have you, you know, what'd you have for breakfast? Hey, would you like to win a truck full of toys? Oh yeah, child, I'd love to. And then that became a game show. It was the first live action animated game show. So basically you had six real children in squares, like University Challenge. Yeah, them. yeah. Sorry, three real children with three cartoon characters <laughs> who's the other, who were the other contestants. Then, right. And then... Chad and the Earl were the presenters and Lewis and I would go into the studio in London and we'd record these scripts of all the... And we would just have so much fun together because we would, we'd go off script, we'd improvise, we'd come up with stuff, we'd riff, you know. And it's the best. It's, it's absolutely the best feeling when you're, when you're working with someone who, A, that you love and B, you really respect and, yeah, and yeah. you admire all at the same time and the feeling's mutual. You just want each other's work to be the best. So you just, it's not about making the other person laugh in terms of tripping them up. It's about making the other person 
Bring out their best. Bring out their best. And if you're both doing it, it lifts yeah. everything. And Scatuni was a real highlight for me as a, as a, as a voice actor um, because Lewis and I got to work together and uh, just were like two kids playing. It was just fantastic. It's like when you see um, those behind-the-scenes tapes of Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. That's like it. Doing That's Derek exactly and Clark. It. It's like, what's the worst bloody job yeah. you ever had? I'll take your lobsters out of Jane Mansfield's ass. Oh, yeah. I used to wipe at the post bogeys. <laughs> yeah, that exactly. kind of thing. Oh, yeah. That's, it's that. It's, it's, except they did it at midnight. Well, after having had a few. I'm more than a few. I think they probably bought the pub. Um, <laughs> but, yes, no, we were stone cold sober. But, yes, it, it um, well, maybe we weren't. Mm. Well, you're a wine drinker, so <laughs> yes, yes. Let's yes. segue well, into that. Is that like your default to you finish a job, you'll go for wine? No, no, no. I, I, um, I like wine with food. Yeah, and I'm all about wine and food matching. So before I moved to Australia, I did my wine uh, exams. So you're a sommelier. I'm. So I could be. Yes, I could <laughs> you're get not a job. Sure, you're not quite sure. No, I could get a job. I, 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 I'm qualified. I know enough about wine to get a job as a sommelier. It's just that I've got the shake, so I'd be like. <laughs> so I think I'd be spilling, you know, Petrus all over somebody's, you know, white. But you've shirt. got a collection, don't you? Mm. Yeah, I love wine. I, I collect wine. I buy it. I sell it. I invest in it. I, I drink it. I, so what? Uh, what is it. the wine collection like? Is it like you? You can't drink it. You have to have it there on display. Or it's no, a- no, it's not on display. No, it's it's in. I, I have a, I have a Eurocab at home, which is a, a wine fridge, which um, is in, in the same room as my studio. <laughs> <laughs> It's got to be keep the important things yeah. together. Yeah. After a really heavy session of just like a yeah. terrible book, it's just yeah. <laughs> that's it. And then I have wine in storage at Wynock in Chatswood, and then I have some wine uh, in London as well. So it's quite diversified. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, as I say, I like wine to go with food. So I, I mean, I've met a lot of people here in Australia, and they go, "Nah, I just drink Shiraz, mate." <laughs> and I'm like, "Nothing else." Nah, just Shiraz. Or just drink Ben Folds. And you go, okay, fine. And you go, well, have, have you tried a Viognier? Nah. Have you tried a, you know, Côte du Rhône? Have you tried a Rioja? Have you tried a Tempranillo? Have you tried a Barol? You know. Uh, no, nah, nah. You know, and, and it's just, it's quite interesting. So I, I will, I really like, the thing is when you get into wine, it's, 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 you just, it's, you just keep diving. It's, it's a money pit. It's a, it's a money pit. And it's, um, that's why I sell a lot of wine. I would buy, I'll buy six bottles of something because you have to buy it in a six, because yeah. a lot, all my wine I bought in the UK and I shipped it all over here. Okay. And, but you had to buy a minimum of six. And I'd, I'd open a bottle and go, I don't think I like this. I think I'll sell the other five. Yeah. So, or sell three and keep two. In case you find a in, meal that in case it with, ages in case, better as well. Yeah, in case it might age better or in case I find a meal that might suit it better. Have you found a wine that you like but you couldn't pair with a meal? Oh, gosh. Have I found a wine I like that I couldn't pair with a meal? Somebody cue the uh, Jeopardy music. No. Ben, you got that teed up. <laughs> um, no. 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 I, uh, I've found meals that are quite hard to pay with wine. Um, meat pie? <laughs> meat pie. <laughs> meat pie. <laughs> cup of tea, mate. I'd have, a, <laughs> I'd have a cup of builders any day of the week with a meat pie, mate. Yeah. No. Um, did you just do the cockney neck? Yeah, of course you did, mate. Yeah, mate. Yeah, oh, it's sunshine. Um, no, it, it's it's... It's just fun. I love it. I, I'm and all during during lockdown, I learned how to make cocktails as well. I'd never drunk cocktails in my life. I've never been into spirits, and now I really am. <laughs> you know, I'm just like you know, I go on to Nick's or whatever, and I'm just going, like, I need shot green chartreuse. I need Dom Benedictine. I need you know creme de cacao. I need you know six different types of gin and and you know four <laughs> different types of rum and three different types of rye and two different types of cognac. And I'm going to mix them all together and make stuff and. Have bitters. you ever tried the different bitters, Vespa with the Shit. cocktail? The Vespa? Yes. I have not tried the Vespa yet. No, I, I haven't tried that one. I'm a recent fan of uh, coffee and cigars. Uh, the drink, which is yes. Jemison's, yes. Triple Sec and Kahlua. Ooh, Kahlua yeah. instead of Mr. Black's. Haven't had Mr. Black's. Because Mr. Black's is an Australian coffee liqueur. Oh, shoot. All right. Kahlua is the, the global one, and yeah. Kahlua's got sugar in it. So the Mr. Black's hasn't got any sugar in it. So... What was it again? Triple sec? Triple sec? Yeah. Jameson. Jameson. Or any kind of whiskey yeah, for that yeah. matter. And yeah, just coffee liqueur. And coffee liqueur. Try Mr. Black's. Mr. Black's. Because A, it's Aussie, an Aussie brand and it's also brilliant. Okay. Um, but also it might be a little, it might make your cocktail a little less sweet. So you might need to put a little 
tiny bit of simple syrup in it. Just just if you like the sweetness of Kahlua. But um, okay. yeah. drinking well, tips with pop. Drinking tips. Well, it's that idea. Like Australians do a lot of shit really well. Like Archie Rose do some amazing great gins. work. Yep, great yeah, great gins. Yeah. The vodka is just flawless. Yes, they do a rye, which is really good. Yep, their single yeah. malt's pretty nice. Yeah. No, I, it, it's a problem my other half yeah. knows I really enjoy their stuff. <laughs> and now every time they do their trials and exceptions, I get a bottle and I go, because I don't drink as much. I'm like, yeah. this is just going to sit here for a year. Yeah, well, I'll get to it. <laughs> but that's fine. Because a bottle of wine, if you open it, mm. it you've got to drink it. Ah. Coravins are great. Have you had a, you've got a Coravin? It's, it's the, the, the needle. Oh, that's the one that kind of pierces in, through and then you can needle, still… Replace it with argon and then you means you can tip out a little glass or something and go, that's not ready and I'll put that back. <laughs> Far out. I've had a bottle under Coravin now for three years. Three years? Yeah. And I How long do you plan on keeping it? Well, it's it's a bottle of um, Apera, which is like a Amontillado sherry, yeah. Yeah. which I put every Christmas into eggnog. I make an amazing eggnog. And we, so, we needed that last week. <laughs> oh, it's true again. Very good, very, very good. Um, but this bottle of Apera I put under Coravin because I only wanted to use a little bit every year. And uh, it's from Sepplesfield. And uh, it's last, this bottle's lasted three years and it's still fresh as a daisy. Wow. Whereas wow. normally sherry would uh, uh, sherry would sort of go off after maybe four weeks, uh, if, unless you keep it in the fridge, maybe six weeks in the fridge. Like I can't vermouth. see anyone I know opening a bottle and having it last four hours, let alone four weeks. Well, yeah, but wine maybe, but sherry is quite it's quite a distinctive taste. And amontillado, it's it's a very sort of um, dry. Uh, you can really taste that that sort of yeah. oxidation you get from the salera and everything. Um, uh, vermouth is a really important yeah. thing because because. I well, I only learned this in the last two years because because when I've been getting to drinks, but everybody keeps vermouth thinking it's a spirit. It's not a spirit. Vermouth will go off after four weeks unless you keep it in the fridge. And even if you keep it in the fridge, it'll be it'll be gone after eight weeks. Wow. So your dry vermouth, your sweet vermouth, get them in the half bottles if you're making martinis because that shit will go off, man. You no, want nothing worse than make a martini with some old vermouth because it will just go. Ugh. Yeah. You know, so yeah, and people, you, no one knows this. You'd be so surprised. You go to anybody's house and they have their little drinks cabinet. There'll be a bottle of vermouth there. There'll be a bottle of Dolan or or, or Norley Pratt or Cinzano, whatever you want to call it. And yeah, they bought that in 1978. <laughs> no, thank you. My mother still has a bottle of vermouth from I think 1968. Sitting she hasn't in her been listening. Thing, and I'm like, she throw that out. She said, no, it looks nice and it's old. I'm like, okay. Fine. I mean, as long as Not it's only it. for aesthetic purposes. Mm. Like empty bottles yeah. can be a wonderful aesthetic. Like, it might show that you're an alcoholic. It's full, but... never been cracked. It. <laughs> but, uh, oh. Oh, what's that, Baker's oh. Mark 46? Oh. oh, hello. Right, we're going to have... Uh, <laughs> I mean, yes. we're all driving, but a single up, up one. Up for the camera. Yeah. Uh, up for the camera. Oh, is this and for my own eyes. That's very nice. So you got, are you guys into your booze then? I, I take it you are then. I shouldn't. Uh, be, one but. of us more than the other. I, I'm I'm a simple man of simple taste. I get some vodka and I put juice in it because I like my sugar. Oh, that's Dad, good. You'll die if you drink anything else. Um, I mean, there is a problem with that. There's a great guy called Anders Ericsson. Uh, he's in Wisconsin. He's yeah. he's fan, does fantastic YouTube channel um, called. Um, I think that office seriously there. Anders if you want one. No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I might have, have a smell of it though. Okay. Oh shit! I've just pulled off the fucking wax. The wax. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> nah, no, 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 no. Maybe, 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 maybe. Um, oh, fuck it, yes. <laughs> well, it's feel not like, often that I'm going to be I feel like Elon Musk with Joe Rogan. Come on, let's, got the let's have a big fucking spliff. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christ. Uh, the um, bottle doesn't get easier to open. It certainly doesn't. <laughs> but um yeah so there's some great uh cara divine has a great podcast called behind the bar she's she's a scottish lass who works out of melbourne she does a fantastic um actually i think i have seen her yeah and she always ends each one with so now you know and uh she's really good she makes fantastic cocktails and anders and the educated barfly he's really good and there's this english guy who, who's uh he's got a really cool bar with lots of skulls and candles and shit and i can't remember his but there's about four that i regularly watch and then i kind of Nick from them and then yeah. I kind of mix and match and try and find my own. I'm really, I like uh, a Vieux Carré. I discovered a Vieux Carré recently in, in the last year, which is, um, it's like, do you like a Manhattan? It's, it's, oh, a, yes. it's a New Orleans Manhattan. So it's equal parts, sweet vermouth, cognac and um, rye. And then with uh, some Dom Benedictine and then a double splash of Angostura bitters and a double splash of um, Peixos bitters, which is the, you know, that New Orleans and then lots of ice, nice bit of dilution, you know, stir, and then you can just serve it up, and it's a bit of bit of. Orange. I feel like you it's have beautiful. to be at a certain level of sober to be able to make these things. 
Because I think that's one of the advantages of just going for juice and vodka. It's a bit, a bit, a, I'm good. This is a first, I've got to admit, I've never drunk whiskey drunk out of whiskey a paper out cup. Out of a paper cup. cup. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't even like coffee out of a fucking paper cup. I know, so, I, this know, is going to be a weird experience. I'm that Here's much to of it. a snob, but um, this is... And you're not having any, I take it. No, not for me. One bat. Mm. Mm. Papery. Mm. Papery? I think I, words, whoa, 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 that was, that was, <gasps> that was, God, it, it was literally, I was thought it was going to fly off, but. The, the bottle was about to like, go. I can't the audio. Reach <laughs> it. You have those moments in slow mo in a lot mm. in life, but mm. y- you made a documentary about wine. I produced a documentary Produced-try. about wine. Yes, I did. I didn't make it. Um, it was a documentary about natural wine. Okay. Um, and well, I didn't produce it. No, that's not fair. That's absolutely. I mean, IMBD, IMBD says producer. Okay. Does it? You got to uh, can't argue with IMBD. What, what's the, what's the, what's the thing called? Oh, we have to get it back up. Ah, because it's I did two things with wine in the title. Let me get your. Is it hundred bottles of wine? I think three hundred bottles. Of oh, okay, six hundred bottles of wine. 600, so 600. I love how it went from 100, yeah. 300, yeah. Six. 600. A thousand. Yeah, so 600 bottles of wine isn't a documentary about wine. 600 bottles of wine is a is a 10 part um, uh, drama comedy series um, written and produced and directed by my good friend Grace Rouvray and her team. And I can't remember the other two. 600 bottles, yeah. executive producer. And um, I was executive producer on it, which was a very kind way of saying that I gave them You gave the money. money. <laughs> Um, and which was, you know, because I love her and she's terrific and she's made this amazing series and they did it all on a very low budget. And um, she and it had the word wine in the title. The and, wine in the it. title and it was brilliant. It's all set in Redfern. It's about a bunch of girls that live in Redfern. It's all about their, their relationships and their love lives and about what it's like being in your 20s, living in, in Sydney, in modern Sydney. And they made it just before COVID. And, That's pretty um, cool. They're so talented, these guys. One of them starred in it. One of them wrote it. The other directed it. Um, and they sold it to the BBC and Netflix. Incredible. And uh, nice. it's, they've done really well. And so, yeah. So that was. In turn, so have you. And they very, yes, and they very <laughs> kindly gave me an executive producer credit. <laughs> but I did also finance a, a documentary about wine, about natural wine, which was a few that years ago. That wasn't Last in Orders, was it? No, Last Orders was a short film that I, I produced um, with David Heyman and Adrian Dunbar um, about two guys. So sitting in a pub, a lot. Everything I do seems to be set in a pub. I don't it's know very it, my dinner with Andre. It, like, yeah, it's like I've made a film I mean, set in a pub. Bob the Builder wasn't set but, in a pub. No, <laughs> well, we've recorded it in a pub. No, no, like, <laughs> that, no. That's that's Bob the Builder. The day, yeah, <laughs> days end where it's just like Bob. Comes Bob the Builder. In. <laughs> Normally we ended up in the pub, um, <laughs> especially with the people who were on the show because we all loved our, our beer and wine. <laughs> but um, um, on Bob nice. the Builder, you were the only cast member, as far as I can tell, who did both the UK and the US version of the show. How did that come about? Um, yeah, I think there were... Uh, yeah, so... <laughs> I my, I've, I lived in America when I was a kid. My, yeah. Um, I've been speaking with an American accent since I was, you know, six years old. Um, and I was a member of the North American Actors Registry of Equity in the UK. And a lot of my voiceover work was American in, in London. And so I was doing Bob the Builder. And um, they said, look, you know, we, my friend who did the Jim Carrey quote, yeah. Bill DeFries, he was the voice of Bob the Builder in America. And it was Bill who actually introduced me to the producers to be in Bob the Builder. And they they immediately thought, to be in the American version. And when they realized that I was English, they right. said, well, you were the English version. And then it was sort of like, um, I ended up doing both. Cause, yeah, because when I went through all the credits, you were going through Bob the Builder, you're the only one with UK and US yeah, credit. Yeah, so Scrambler, um, Scrambler, how did he sound? Um, Scram to the Valley, yeah, it rocks, hello, Bob. And um, so all I had to do was basically go, Scram to the Valley, hey, Bob, you rock. And it was just literally <laughs> doing the same stuff in an American accent. But then some, like Muck was a character in 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 Bob the Builder voiced by Rob Rackstraw and Muck would always go, let's get mucky. But in America it was, let's get muddy. <laughs> and they had someone else voice it. So someone goes, let's get muddy. And I'm like, it was just weird. Like Gripper and Grabber, which Rob and I did, we made just 
the scouse skits from <laughs> Harry Enfield. All right, mate. Easy, mate. How's it going, mate? All good, mate. And we played, and we just ripped off Harry Enfield and Paul yeah, Whitehouse yeah. going, hey, mate. All right, hey, 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 grip her, grab her, grip her, and grab her. And then when I went and did the American version, it was, we're my them Southern rednecks. Hi, Gripper. Hi, Gripper. <laughs> and you know, and it was just like. What does that say about us, Scousers? <laughs> I know. It's just like redoing it all again in, in, and, but changing the odd like word. Mm. Thomas, the tank engine, for example, which I, I did for a few years, Thomas and Friends, um, the fat controller is called the fat controller. Mm. But in America, fat might trigger people with weight issues. So it's, um, it's a top em hat. What? What? Because he's got a top hat, so he's Sir Topham Hat. I've never heard that. Because the fat controller is, to an American audience, is considered possibly offensive. Don't get me started. (laughs) Um, (laughs) We won't, don't worry. So we had to re... Again, with with the Thomas Thomas as well, I I did the the, uh, British and US version version of Thomas as well. Yeah, Um, Um, which is fun. A random question, because mm. um, I know there's a couple in Star Wars from an actor whose name I should not be forgetting, but he, he voiced Darth Maul. Mm, yes, Peter Serafinovich. Um, yeah. yeah. No, no, sorry, for the, for the animated series. I have no oh, idea. Um, one of my favorite actors, and I'm just blanking on him, but um, mm. do you have like any inside jokes you've put in, into roles that no one has picked up? The first thing that comes to my head is... I used to do a lot of ADR, a lot of yeah, yeah. automatic dialogue replacement, a lot of dubbing, crowd work, you know, sort of crowd session stuff. For years, I'd, uh, eight or ten of us would congregate behind microphones. And so, you know, you can hear my voice in Goldeneye and Twelve Monkeys yeah. and Bridget Jones and and oh, so many films. I mean, done hundreds of, of, of movies where, you, where even now I'll be watching it and go, oh, that was me. <laughs> just going walk on yes, I had to dude. get checks for Pride and Prejudice with Colin Firth and Jennifer Ailey which was back in 1995 oh my god yeah. I still get checks for like £16.72 p or £1.84 from a DVD yeah. sale to the Ukraine or something or you know something like that it was so weird because residuals used to be so different yeah and it all goes I still get you know probably 30 quid a year for you know I had one the other day for 65 pence <gasps> oh that's the lowest literally a check with a Perforate. <laughs> it would have cost more to, set- to send to Australia. 60 <laughs> for Touch yes. of Frost. Because I was in an, one episode of Touch of Frost and they did some kind of Denmark video on demand. The yeah, number of stunt forms. And I was that in I know, one scene, I had like two fucking lines. Yeah. I, mean, 60, I mean, 65p, but really? Yeah. Really? Anyway, so um, <laughs> it was just crazy. So we're doing this dubbing session on, um, can't remember what it was, but it was a Dickens. It was some BBC Dickens thing. Yeah. And we're all behind the mic and it's a scene in a tavern and we're just the crowd in the background. And because we're wanting to amuse ourselves, we were like, Oi, Oliver, get your twist around here, mate. Yeah, got a tale for you, Tale of Two Cities. You know. <laughs> Where's David? Oh, David's having a cop of you. Oh, that house is a bit bleak, isn't it? Yeah, you know, so, and, and you know, Charles Witt, what Martin? Oh, Martin Charles Witt. Yeah, I know Martin. He's, and we started listing, you know, he's got great expectations. And, and, <laughs> and we just started. So if you listen very carefully, you might hear a <laughs> bunch of people in the pub listing Dickens titles. Just That's in conversation. First, yeah, just in conversation. Brilliant. That's the it. first one that came to mind. Um, um, I suppose you could only really get away with stuff like that with the dubbing because it's just yeah. background stuff. Whereas, you know, like doing the Star Wars video games, like when we did... Empire at War. I think I've done three, three or four Star Wars video games. Um, Empire at War. I think Knights of the Old Republic. Um, something else. Literally, it's it's they are. Excuse me, it's making me burp. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, That's it, the paper. Yeah, it's good. Um, it it um, it's very precise. You know, you get your, your your script, and it's like you know, jumps off a six foot wall, jumps off a twelve foot wall, <laughs> jumps off a twenty foot wall. You know, lands from a six foot wall. <laughs> Lands from it, you know. Yeah, gets punched in the stomach, gets slapped in the stomach, gets winded in the stomach. So you're going, and then, oh, and you do this for hours. You know, you know, his finger gets blown off, his hand gets blown off, his arm gets blown off. You know, you feel like you know the 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 the, the knight in in, the, in Monty Python. Okay, that's right. Come on, go with the other one. <laughs> Still got me, still walking her. Um, so, and, and you get these things, video games, and you go, and I said to this producer once, I said, why don't you just 
make a library of all of these, right? Pay us like some kind of royalty, some kind of usage fee, so we don't have to keep coming back <laughs> and wrecking our voices doing this, which is utterly boring as batshit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, it, and you go, he's going, well, we're paying you. I'm like, after two hours of this, yeah. and then you've got to go off and do a commercial, and you go, I'm so sorry, I've lost my voice. So you got to protect your voice. That's why I said, if you want me to go, ah, motherfuckers, for two hours, can we just make a, a little library of, of sound effects and just call them? And of course, now that's really happening. But now they they don't even now they're not even going to pay people. It's like we can sort of deep fake your yeah your whatever. And so the whole thing's fucked, man. <laughs> <laughs> Completely and utterly fucked. Well, because we're all going to be out of a job soon. One of your first <laughs> dubbing jobs was an anime, wasn't it? Like back it in- was. Like, cause my mm, God, you have done your research a um, little bit. It's uh, like a, 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 yes, because I'm an anime fan. Yes, and like Urotsuke Doji, <laughs> Legend of the Overfiend. <laughs> uh, my favorite line in anime was, "Let's give those motherfuckers a taste of nuclear shit." <laughs> <laughs> and like you go and you like especially back in the 80s and the 90s when they weren't quite exact with the dubs you go online and one of my favorites is uh Lupin the Third and you go to the American dubs of these and there's some really obscure shit it's like let's get chicken nuggets and you go where does this come, where is this from? come from I've no idea it's like yes exactly or the, or the sort of the all the, the private parts are all blurred out yep oh my god they're gonna see the lot <laughs> <laughs> and I'm dubbing this thing in some basement in St. Anne's Court in Soho circa 1994 or whatever. You know, going, wow, this is, I like this. This is, <laughs> this is fun. I did a thing called Keku Kamen and uh, there was a gym teacher. So I made him like Annie and this sort of, I'm your gym teacher. <laughs> you come. <laughs> then the second part of Keku Kamen was when I brought in Alec Guinness. He yeah. was a samurai and he was... He was the samurai warrior who was sort of, you know, he had the robes on and he had the samurai sword and a light, your father's lightsaber. <laughs> and, um, it, was, it was, those anime things were great. But they they're were, known for, like, especially what's called shonen, is there's a lot of screaming involved. And yes. these people will do, like, just, they will only be able to do, like, 45 minute blocks and have to stop for three hours. It your voice. It's insane. It's, it's, yes, yes, absolutely. It's, I lost the very first thing I, not one of the first things I dubbed was a film called Stalingrad. Oh. And I was trying to impress the the director. Uh, it was the English dub of this movie that came out, I think, in, in 93, 94. Yeah. Brilliant film, by the way. It's it's a German film made by, um, uh, I think, Konstantin, film Konstantin. Um, and it's it's a really, really brilliant film. And they get got in the Russian front. And I, I was 24 and I wanted to impress the director. You know, <laughs> such an idiot. And... Um, <laughs> Been there. So I'm like, I'll do that one. I'll do that. And I volunteered for every death scene, every, you know. Oh. <laughs> ah, I will get you where you're going. Ah. And 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 then I wrecked my voice and uh, I learned a very valuable lesson. I, I learned a similar lesson <laughs> on uh, live productions. Yes. I've had, I've had a few where it's just like, all right, and now we're just going to brutally murder you. And I've learned to be like, okay, you get two takes. You get two takes. Yeah. Oh, Absolutely. Because I I did three, thinking three is probably a good limit. And then the next day, just sent a text like, I can't talk. How how much Mm. of my dialogue do you need today? Absolutely. I did an animation series called called Chop Socky Chooks. And um, I played this uh, villain, Bubba, who was this Dr. Wasabi, played by Paul Kay. He was sort of, you know, this little fish in a bowl. And he had this sort of German protester thing. And I was, Bubba was this big gorilla, you know. Oh, what are you doing? And this scene was like, two pages long and it was Bubba dives through a plate glass window, Bubba swings on this and Bubba, you know, and I'm, and I'm going, ah, ah, yeah. scene for, and I'm seeing stars. <laughs> I'm, my veins are up. I'm sweating. You know, when you, 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 you bang your head and you start seeing. Yeah. Yeah. And I was seeing flickery stars and I'm, and I'm <laughs> out of breath. I'm given everything. And then the direct leans in, <laughs> talk back and goes, Okay, good. Um, so on page two, line 14, it, it, it said he jumped 40 feet. It sounded a bit like 20 feet. Can, can <laughs> we... And I said, can we, I'm going, I said, can we, can we, um, can we uh, do it as a, oh, fuck. Can we do it as a, can we do it as a drop in? And, and I'm looking through the glass and going, 
you know. Um, could we do another take? <laughs> and I said, I'm not a Pro Tools plugin. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, do you think you've got one more in you? It'll be the last, I promise. And I'm like, can I just have a glass of water? And I did it again. And then, and I thought it wasn't as good as the first take. And I went, I'm not doing another one. I said, I'm not doing another one. I said, the last one, right? That was the last one. Yes, it's promise. <laughs> so you just, oh, fuck, man. It, you, it, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Is there any roles that you'd ever want to revisit? I mean, obviously, you know, you, there's a long gap between when it comes to, like, The Doors of Stone, but are there things that you've had so much passion about? You're like, fuck, I want to go for another run. I want to give more to that. Return to Bob the Builder. You know, it's funny you ask that, but I did a play called Stones in His Pockets um, in the West End of London, and I was in it for coming on for two years, doing eight shows a week. I think I did somewhere in the region of 600 performances. And if you told me I was going to do that play again, I would jump at it. Really? Loved it. Yeah. It was a two-hander. Oh, right, yes. Yeah. Who were you playing with? Uh, <laughs> I, I, play, I, play with two, <laughs> I played with two guys. I spent the first six months, uh, six to nine months, with an a Irish actor called Brian Doherty, and then the second uh, batch with uh, my good friend Hugh Lee. And it was one of those things where, I don't know if you've heard of Stones in His Pockets. It was written by Myrie Jones. She, she uh, played... Uh, Jerry Conlon's mother in, in the name of the father. Her husband, Ian McElhinney, who plays the granddad in Derry Girls, you know, yes, watch Derry Girls. Yes, it's fantastic. He's, you know, he's like there. He's the guy with the white beard who's like, oh, he's got You're an absolute gobs, Joe. Yeah, you're, yeah you're, he's got the white, always has the hat and the white beard. Anyway, so he he was our director. And um, I I went to see Stand in His Pockets um, at, the, at the Tricycle Theatre in Kilburn with Conleth Hill, who's from Game of Thrones, I believe. Irish guy, bald, big. Yes. Um, don't know. He, he put on all that weight for, uh, for, for Stones. And it's about two young guys who meet on a film set, two guys who meet in a film set in Ireland, on a Hollywood film shooting in Ireland. And he's working, one of them's working, working in a video shop, and he fancies himself as a, as a filmmaker and meets this other guy, um, uh, Jake, and it's Charlie. And they meet on this Hollywood film and... It's all about how the Hollywood movies disrupt disrupts local communities and how all the local communities love Hollywood and Hollywood leave all their shit and fuck off. <laughs> uh, and the two actors play all the parts. It's it's you play all twenty characters in the play. And at the end of the first act, one of these kids won't won't get an autograph from the movie star, and he walks into the river with stones in his pockets and he kills himself. And it's it turns the you know they have a funeral and the, the producers won't let everyone have the day off for the funeral. And it's it's a brilliant play. So I wanted, I called the casting director when, when I knew that there was going to be a cast change. Uh, and I phoned up the casting director and said I wanted to be in it. And she said, you don't sound Irish. And I said, no, I'm not Irish. She said, oh, you have to be Irish to be in this plan. I said, oh, you know, I can do the accent. She said, no. So I waited a few months, had a cast change. Then there was going to be another cast change. It was in the West End by this point. It was a huge hit. It won all the Olivier Awards. And Conleth and Sean went off to Broadway. They won the Tony Awards. And it was, it was so good. And... Um, so I phoned up the casting director again and I said, look, I'd like to audition for this play. And I basically doctored my CV and I made out that I was from Ireland and I changed my answering machine message on my mobile and my landline saying this is Rupert Hill. Covering all your bases. Covered all the bases. And um, she said, oh, great. Do you want to come in for an audition at the American church in Tunnel Corridor? And I went, yeah. My shop there's Ian McElhaney and he's like, hey, Rupert, hey, good to meet you, mate. How you doing? And I'm like, hi. He says, where are you from? Now, I just looked up in the... Um, uh, I've told this story before, so it's not like I'm giving it away. Yeah. But I looked up uh, in the Rough Guide of Ireland. I thought, I've got to find out where I'm from. What's my backstory? Yeah. So I found a town in Donegal called Muff, and I thought that was quite <laughs> funny because, you know, they get the crack, get it? Yeah. And, um, and there was a comedy festival. And all it said about Muff was, well known for its comedy festival, the mm. banana, banana comedy or something like that. Yeah. That's all it said. So I go in and doing Charlie, who's from... He's from London, Derry, Donegal. He's from the top. You know, he's from Derry, or, or I think he's from Donegal, but he's from the north. And he's like, you know, talks like that and everything. And then he said, "Okay, no, let's hear your, your Simon. Simon's dub four. So suddenly he became like, you know, Bob Geldof or Bono. You know, it suddenly went into that. And then you know, the Scottish guy who's the security guard, the big, you know, Glaswegian chap. And then the American movie star was, oh my god, it was sort of like Renee Zellweger or you know, um, whoever, uh, uh, fuck, you know." Someone, Anyone. someone, yeah, um, Julie Roberts, whatever. 
And then the old director, the English director, and I said to all these voices, and he's like, oh, oh, you're very good at voices. And he said, can you hang around? I want you to read opposite another actor. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, this is interesting. So they, and I was there, six or seven people all in the room, you know, real Irish actors, and I'm just cacking my fucking pants. I'm like, I am, uh, yeah, I'm all in. <laughs> no, I'm like, you, you got it. There's no fake in this, right? Oh, I mean, well, yes. Well, apparently I there is. Right. <laughs> it's you, full method. It's full. You got, you're all in. You can't give yourself, you can't, Not you yet. can't show sweat yet. I mean, this, this is like Serpico undercover, right? <laughs> So I'm like, okay, <laughs> fuck Pacino, I'm going to go undercover. Right, so I'm, I'm there. And then he says, so he's, we're saying the card, he goes, so where are, you, where are you from? And I said, ah. and I literally, I could just feel, I feel myself go, <laughs> you could have warmed your hands on my face. <laughs> and I went, I'm from, a, I'm from Muff. He said, I know Muff very well. <laughs> I said, I said, he said, have you performed it? I said, banana card comedy. Yeah, I performed there a couple of times. Grand. I said, who did you? And, and then so it was like, we're ready to come back. And so I went and read it again. And then I got a call saying I'd got the part and they, I, they wanted me to sign a six month contract in the West End. And I, and I was like, fucking, you know, because it was my dream to be in the West End. That was my dream yeah. as a kid was to be in the West End stage and to have my picture on in the in the big on the cabinets outside in the street and have my name up on on the on the board in the in the in Soho and it was just like my fantasy come true you know that and being in Star Wars and and that one happened um and I mean you've been in Star Wars material yeah, in a way yeah, now you have yeah, you yeah. Fulfill both. but it was so on the first day of rehearsal uh we went around the room said what's your name where are you from and I said I'm Rupert and I'm from London and I said it in my English accent and <laughs> Ian went. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Man, if you can convince me, you can convince them." He said, "Good on you." He said, "This is what actors need to do. This is what actors need to do." And I ended up being in the show for two years. Wow! And um, played in Ireland as well. Played in Belfast. Played in Dublin. And um, nobody had any. Nobody cared. It, they were just looking at a performance uh, of someone who could pull it off as opposed to now you'd probably you know no no it's cultural appropriation you're english you can't play irish i mean hope they wouldn't do that but in answer to your question it was such an amazing experience every night going out in front of 500 600 some uh, in belfast and dublin it was a 1, thousand 1200 seater theaters and performing mari's play with ian's direction and playing all these characters and using sort of dance and movement to change characters. No costume changes. I and mean, literally we're talking about it's how you hold your body. So each character had its own kind of thing. So Simon had his hands in his pockets, you know, on his hands in his hips. Charlie's had his hands in his pockets. Clem had his trousers up here. Caroline was always playing with her ear. Um, old Mickey was, you know. And so you'd move your body and every moment when you're acting in front of the audience is telling you if what you're doing is right. Like theater is an actor's medium, film is a director's medium, right? Yeah. Act, film is not an actor's medium. It's a, theater is an actor's medium because when that show starts and you're on that stage and you've got an audience, you are making, you're, you're the editor, you're the sound designer, you are in, you're the cinematographer, you are in control. It's up to you if you're going to be in the light or not. And you need, and that's why for me, my first love is theater. And, Again, long answer to your question, but the one I would love to revisit is that play because A, it's theatre, which is my absolute joy as an actor. It's where I'm at my most free, but also it's that particular play. I just, every night I'd get new laughs or new moments or you'd find new bits. And I remember coming off stage one night with you after, and I just said, I think we've just done the perfect show. You know, David Suchet, the actor who played... Poirot. Do you remember David Suchet, English actor? Oh, Hercule Poirot in, um, in the series, in, in the series, TV yeah. series. Um, he always has a bottle of fine Bordeaux in his in his dressing room. He's had it for 40 years. And people have said, what's the wine? He says, I will open it when I give the perfect performance. Did you go out and get one? <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, you know, there was another one, Ralph Richardson, uh, went, before he died, years before he died, he was running around the theatre going, I've, I've, lost, I've lost this box. It's a very important box. It's a wooden box. It's, it's got mother of pearl in it. I need it. And everyone is frantically running around the theatre trying to find this, this box. 
And they're going, what? What's? So I need, I need this box. I need this box. I can't go on stage without this box. Said, What's in the box? My talent. My talent is in the box. He was that nervous. He just, he was, he was just having a bit of a. He just imbued this box. He imbued with this, the... yeah, and he lost it, and it was just this token. It was a totem in his, like David Suchet's bottle of wine. It was just this thing of, if that bottle of wine is in my dressing room. If if I open it, I'm done. It's, I'm you know because you can never be hundred percent happy. So I would want to do that play again because yeah. I think I think there's, there's even though you thought it was perfect before, you want to do it better. Yeah, I'm I'm 20 years older now, and I'm 20 years more mature. I'm 20 years more emotionally intelligent. I'm 20 years. I've got 20 years more experience. I have 20 years worth more of characters. My voice has improved. I think if I did it now, it would be even better than it was 20 years ago because I've got that much more to give it. So that's what I would love to do again, but I will never get to do it again. So it's never going to happen, but I would love it to do it. I want to finish with one final question, but unlike the rest of them, this one might actually have a correct and an incorrect oh. answer. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, just curiously, the earliest credit I could find for your work was 1985 slash 1986. Do you remember what production you recorded and who or what you played? Oh my god! I think we established this right at the start. You screwed. Nineteen eighty-five, eighty-six. Was it a was it a TV thing? Was it a was it was it the great writers Virginia Woolf, The Waves? No, no. Uh, was it Held the Back Page? Uncredited. Yes. Uh, uncredited Schoolboy. Held the yes. Back Page. Uh, Nailed yes. it. They they came to film in my school. Oh wow! And David Warner was the. I did the scene with David Warner, and years later, I did a radio series with David Warner called The Bright Not David, who we lost as well a few months ago. Um, he, very sadly, uh, David was a glorious, a gentleman, lovely, beautiful man. We did The Bright Nomicon, which, check it out, it's fantastic. Um, based on the novel by Robert Rankin, it's all set in Brighton, and it's very fantastical and black magic and dark and comedic. And uh, I play a guy that is saved from a drowning and come back to life, comes back to life and he, he get, enters into the world of the occult in Brighton. And David Warner is Hugo Rune. And uh, again, I produ- executive produced that one as well. It's it's really good. The Brighton Omicron, available and audible. Um, also listen to Grover's Mill, um, if you can, if you haven't heard it. It's a series that I co-wrote with my friend Matt Keon and Amy Horn. Do you know Amy Horn? She's brilliant. She's a voiceover actress here in Australia. She and I played all the characters. And then I also directed it and produced it. And my friend Matt Sladen did all the music and sound design. So a team of four. And we did eight half-hour episodes about, and it's about a psychic, forensic forensic psychic detective called Wilkie Poe, who gets involved in a missing persons case and ends up finding evidence from Orson Welles that uh, the moon landings were faked. (laughs) That sounds amazing. That's a, that's a ride. It's called Grover's Mill because that's where they landed in Orson Welles' 1930s. And that Orson Welles is one of my my heroes. I, I just... I, I, Do you want to give us an Orson Welles to send us off? Orson Welles. We know a remote farm in Lincolnshire where Mrs. Buckley lives. God, this is a piece of shit, you know that. You find me a jury of 12 men to say in July and I'll go down on you. This is preposterous. No. <laughs> Rupert Zegas Orson Welles thank you so much for your time thank you very much it's been an absolute pleasure ladies and gentlemen we'll see you next time thanks guys thank you 